so many people are absolutely confident and certain when they read the book called Revelation. They think their interpretation is obvious and assured. But is it? When it comes to Apocalypse or Revelation or any other book of Scripture, it's good to keep in mind that one and the same set of words or symbols can have at least two different meanings. The Middle Eastern Mediterranean Library called Bible is full of symbols and expressions. It has multiple meanings and it generates a multitude of meanings with various readers. This is especially true with Revelation or Apocalypse. But which of these many meanings did the author have in mind? In other words, what was he actually trying to communicate? Take for instance the four living sky creatures of Revelation chapter 4. What are they? What did John the Seer have in mind when he wrote about them? Don't we see these same sky beings also in the vision reported in Ezekiel chapter 1? What are they? What do they mean? Combing through various scholarly and non-scholarly commentaries produces a plethora of contradictory answers. Who is right? Who is wrong? Can all answers be correct even if they contradict? Perhaps the most crucial question is, which of these interpretations was shared by the author? Many think the four living creatures of Revelation refer to the four canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Is that what John the Seer had in mind? Did those Gospels exist in their present form in his day? Did he know about them and read them and pray with them like we do? And let's say it's true. Okay, which sky creature symbolizes which gospel? And how would you know that? If you ask Irenaeus of Lyon, you will get a different answer to that question than if you proposed the same to Victorinius of Patau or to Saint Jerome. And it is not uncommon to be called impious and sent to hell by these or similar figures should you ever dare to disagree with them. Sadly, this tradition has been passed down to present-day Christians on social media and through so-called apologetics. The problem with allegory gone wild in biblical interpretation and the meaning of the living creatures of Revelation is handsomely illustrated by a recent and exciting discovery. Dr. Lucas Dorfbauer, researcher and expert on patristics literature from the University of Salzburg, recently identified a marvel, something lost for 1,500 years. It is the earliest known Latin commentary on the Gospels by Fortunatianus of Aquileia. This work predates the Latin Vulgate by half a century. It is a treasury of insights into how early 4th century Latin Christians read and understood the Gospels. It also demonstrates how words and images can generate numerous contradictory interpretations, even among those hailing from the same Christian tradition. So let's say that I ask the fathers of the church why the bull creature in Revelation chapter 4 represents the gospel called Luke. Some of these fathers, employing allegory gone wild, will assume that the answer is obvious. It's because of his infancy narrative, Luke chapters 1 and 2, where Jesus is born in a barn-like stable where cows are kept. By the way, something the fathers didn't realize Peasantry in first century Palestine didn't keep cows, whether outside or in home. There were cows in Egypt at the time of Jesus' birth, but not so many in Palestine and definitely not among peasants. And mangers were not barns. They were inside the home and they kept livestock no larger than goats and sheep. But in any case, so many of the fathers say the manger had bulls and Luke has the manger story. Therefore, the bull obviously represents Luke. But if I turn to this recent discovery and I ask Bishop Fortunatianus the same question, well, he provides a contradictory answer. To him, it's because way later in the text called Luke, the so-called parable of the prodigal son features a fatted calf. Calf, that's a bull. Therefore, it's obvious. Luke can only be symbolized by the calf. Please note the very different reasons given. But also note the agreements. First, their interpretation is apparent and evident to them. Second, all of these early Christian commentators employ allegory gone wild. Third, the bull creature must mean Luke. And what happens if you challenge any of these commentators? You're impious and sent to hell. Turning to the lion creature in the book of Revelation, let's say we ask the fathers of the church which gospel it symbolizes. 
Well, Jerome and Augustine will say it's obvious. It can only be the gospel called Mark. Why? Because that gospel opens with someone crying out in the wilderness. And what is the king of the beasts in the wild? The lion, of course. Thank you, allegory gone wild. And if we ask the same to good Bishop Fortunatianus in the recent discovery, he also claims that the meaning is obvious. It can only be the gospel called John. This is the royal gospel, after all. Thank you, allegory gone wild. See, to Irenaeus of Lyon and Fortunatianus of Aquileia, both men know for sure that the lion has to mean John, and the eagle has to mean Mark. How so? Because of their allegory gone wild. But when you go to Jerome and Augustine, they're just as certain about their own contradictory interpretation. It's just as evident to these men that the lion means Mark and the eagle means John. How? The exact same way, by allegory gone wild. Now take this way of reading the scripture, pepper in some supersessionism and some anti-Semitism, and you have a disturbing trend throughout the history of the church and its reading of the Gospels. Scott Hahn and friends romanticize and promote this hazardous way of reading scripture. The literal sense gets thrown right out the window. But shouldn't we begin with the literal sense, that is, with the meaning that the author actually intended? What were the lion and bull in Ezekiel and Revelation? To John the seer, they were constellations, great sky servants of God up in the sky. The lion we call Leo, and the bull is Taurus. My friends, when it comes to interpreting Revelation, or any book of the Bible, the literal sense has to come first. Otherwise, we spiritualize the text away in allegory gone wild.